We are a culture that almost worships children. A lot of us spend a good deal of our income on making sure that their lives are happy and safe, that they have the right phones, that they look good when they go to school, that they get the food that makes them happy, and of course, that they get where they need to be, and then where they need to be, and where they need to be, when they need to be there, as we fill their lives with endless activities, all designed to enrich them. But kids, it wasn't always this way. I think our first hint of this as Christians comes with the story of Isaac. Isaac was, if you remember, the long hoped for son of Abraham and Sarah. A son conceived late in their life after years of frustration and what seemed to be the failed promises of God. But the miracle happened, even as Sarah laughed at its impossibility. And Isaac, whose name means laughter, was born. And it finally seemed that those promises to Abraham and Sarah, that their descendants would be like the stars in the heaven or the grains of sand on the beach, would finally hold true. But after Isaac had grown in strength and years, Abraham heard the voice of God again. And this time God's voice said, Abraham, Take your son Isaac, whom you love, and sacrifice him to me. And we all know the story, don't we? Abraham got some wood for a fire, brought some rope, brought his knife, and told his son they were going to one of the holy places to make an offering. And sometime the way along on this walk, Isaac, who'd been on these worship retreats before, looked around and noticed, "Uh, Dad? We don't have a ram. Observant kid, that Isaac. And Abraham replied, God will provide the ram. But when they got to the place, Abraham bound his son, said his prayers, took out his knife, prepared to strike. No, the voice of God boomed. No, Abraham. Do not hurt the boy. And Abraham turned, and there, caught in a thicket, was a ram. And that ram, which God indeed did provide, became the sacrifice. We call this, of course, the great text, test of Abraham. And it's hard to argue that. It was definitely a test. Would Abraham actually love and trust God enough to sacrifice his beloved son to God? But it wasn't just a test. It was also a lesson. You see, Abraham was surrounded by neighbors who did occasionally sacrifice their children to appease the gods. And the God of Abraham, our God, wanted Abraham and everyone who followed him to know, in no uncertain terms, that this was not acceptable. Human history is filled with stories of the sacrifice of children to appease the gods. And while in our modern age we tend to make fun of this sort of thing, telling jokes and stories about throwing virgins into volcanoes and that sort of thing, people in the ancient world usually did not hesitate to give their children up in worship to appease the power they perceived as the holy. It is a sickening part of the human story. But as if this was not enough, there were even times when infants were seen as something to be tossed aside. We have a famous letter dated to about the time Christ was born, And it's from a Roman citizen to his wife. And it shows how lightly that society regarded infanticide. The letter reads, I am still in Alexandria. I beg and plead with you to take care of our little child. And as soon as we receive wages, I will send them to you. In the meantime, if you give birth, 
If it is a boy, let it live. If it is a girl, expose it. Expose it meant take it to the dump. Leave it there. And let time and the elements do their work. The point here is not to give the most depressing sermon of my career, but rather to help us see how revolutionary the idea presented by Jesus in today's gospel really is. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Children in the ancient world had no standing, none. And yet, here is Jesus saying that welcoming one of these truly least of all is welcoming God. There are, by the way, really two traditions in the scriptures about Jesus and children. The tradition in Matthew and Luke is the one where Jesus talks about their childlike faith and talks about how we should believe like children. And of course, that resonates with truth. But it unfortunately is a tradition that has largely overshadowed the tradition we find in Mark. An important idea that no doubt surprised those who first heard it and probably surprises us a bit as well. As a society, we tend to go over the top a bit with our children. But as people of faith, we tend to forget that welcoming a child into our lives is welcoming God. That any time we welcome one of the least of all into our lives, we welcome God. Isn't it amazing how real how immediate, how present with us this makes our God. The world wants to paint God as somewhere out there, far away, hard to attain. And the world sometimes views holiness as this kind of race where we end up, well, comparing churches and denominations and faiths and end up sounding like the disciples in today's lesson, arguing about who is the greatest. But what does Jesus do? Jesus takes a little one. And he says, you welcome this child. You welcome God. Early Christianity, by the way, took Jesus at his word here. Often rescuing those exposed Roman infants from the dump taking them home, taking them into their own households, and raising them. Welcoming God in an incredibly powerful way into their lives. Gandhi, of course, was a student of Christ. And there was a time in India where there was a great deal of religious unrest and rioting. And a man named Nahari was brought to him. And Nahari came in screaming, I'm going to hell. I have killed a child. I smashed his head against the wall. And Gandhi, who was weak from fasting at this point, fasting to try to get everyone to stop it, looked at Nahari and said, why? And Nahari responded, my boy, my son, the Muslims killed my son. And Gandhi replied, I know a way out of hell. You go and you find a boy. A boy whose mother and father have been killed. And you take him in. And you raise him as your own. But be sure he is a Muslim. And be sure you raise him as one. Welcome the least of all into your life. And you welcome God. 
One last thought. I think all of us at times wonder about our worthiness before God. And this story is important to remember when we're feeling that way. We are always, always the children of God. You are always God's child. And if God is what John promises, pure love, in its truest form, then we can count on God to be the parent who is always there for us in love. For the good parent never stops loving, no matter what the child might do, no matter what the faults of the child might be. Even if the child turns away, love is what love is, and love never ends. When you're down on life, or down on yourself, remember this story of Jesus. Remember how he took a little one, brought that little one into the presence of the disciples and wrapped his arms around that little one and said, you welcome this little one. You have welcomed God. And then remember, you could have well been that little one. In many ways, you are. That's how important you are to God. That's how important we are. We are important to God in ways beyond our deserving.